Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm with JP. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So uh, our podcast today is on uh, spinal trauma and essentially how we can do this better. Uh, JP, if you wouldn't mind doing a, just a quick introduction of yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is JP Colson. I'm a medical doctor in my sixth year of neurosurgery residency at Rush University in Chicago. I'm originally from Florida, a proud son of the Sunshine State. Uh, and now nearing the end of my neurosurgical residency, uh, I've taken a great interest in neurotrauma, primarily spinal cord injury, uh, as well as elective spine surgery. And so this has been an area for me um, academically that I've focused on uh, a great deal in the past few years. I'm excited to have this opportunity to come and speak with you about it, Dennis. Thanks for having me. Oh, I absolutely appreciate uh, you coming on because we don't really often get a neurosurgeon to actually speak with me at all. So um, just starting off, I do I definitely see some confusion when it comes to spinal shock and neurogenic shock and what is the difference and how are they the same and do they run together, et cetera, et cetera. So if you wouldn't mind just, uh, just to kind of start things off, uh, getting these definitions out of the way, what, uh, what are they? What's the differences? Sure. Um, it, it's funny that you brought that up because this is something that bothered me for years when I first entered the medical field and then entered my specialty of neurosurgery because these terms uh, I noticed when I was younger were used interchangeably, although they refer to very different things. Um, I will say that these days, again, anecdotally in my experiences, when I go down to the emergency room and the trauma bays, at least where I work, it seems like people confuse these terms less. And so maybe we're doing a better job of kind of educating and delineating these entities. But to, to lay it out there simply, spinal shock is a neurologic phenomenon. This is where the spinal cord, after suffering some form of trauma, has dysfunction, neurologic dysfunction. And that dysfunction will exist at the level of injury and then at all levels of spinal tissue distal, we say, to that injury, so further from the head towards the feet. Neurogenic shock, on the other hand, is a hemodynamic uh, phenomenon. So just like hypovolemic shock or cardiogenic shock, similar to that, this is when the body is not perfusing its end tissues and end organs, maintaining blood pressure and perfusion. But in this case, it's because of a neurologic dysfunction, which can be from the brain, but is often from an injury to the spinal cord, specifically those regions of the spinal cord that contain the sympathetic driving neurons that keep up the heart rate, keep up the blood pressure in that sympathetic tone. Okay, perfect. Now, is neurogenic shock just a kind of a continuation of spinal shock in that one is now worse than the other, or can you can they be separate? They can be separate, but as you might imagine, they tend to go hand in hand. Um, those regions of the spinal cord that have the sympathetic drivers, the neurons that drive the sympathetic tone for the systemic blood pressure, for the heart rate, for the heart itself, tend to exist mostly in the thoracic spine. And so if there's injury to the thoracic spinal cord, as you can imagine, you're going to have neurologic dysfunction as well as that low perfusing hemodynamic state as well. Um, what, what I would say is that typically when you see someone with neurogenic shock, that's going to be a pretty severe injury. And so at that point, the patient probably has an outright spinal cord injury, uh, not just a spinal shock. And, and I guess I should distinguish those two things as well. A spinal cord injury is a true actual injury to the tissue of the spinal cord. Spinal shock, on the other hand, you can kind of think of it like a concussion to the head where there's been some force transmitted to the spinal cord, it is in a state of dysfunction, but that might be transient. That might not be a permanent state of dysfunction, whereas the spinal cord injury is a more permanent, more utter 
damage to that spinal cord tissue. So I, I guess a, a simple, maybe a one liner is that spinal shock is when the spinal cord is in shock and dysfunctioning, whereas neurogenic shock is the body in shock in the traditional sense um, due to a neurologic cause. Okay. No, that absolutely makes a lot of sense. No, thank you for kind of walking me through that. Um, now getting into the actual traumas and the types of trauma, uh, if you don't mind, let's start off with just penetrating trauma, the extreme side of things. Um, you know, maybe like an IED blast or a gunshot or something like that actually penetrates the spine and damages spinal tissue. You know, what is my kind of assessment tools? And again, this is, uh, we can go into the, the hospital management and then austere management or, or just talk about the austere, but you know, what kind of assessments are we looking for? What kind of things do we need to do in the immediate to stabilize the patient? And then we can talk about how do we more ongoing care. Yeah. Now, these penetrating spinal cord injuries, these are the worst of the worst, because as you said, this is where some object, uh, sometimes a missile, but not always, um, has directly damaged the tissues of the spinal cord. In contrast, what we would call a blunt or closed spinal cord injury that we'll talk about next, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, there's been no direct damage to the spinal cord tissue. It's either uh, contusive forces transmitted through the body, or if the spine fractures and dislocates and bone can compress the spinal cord tissue, but there's no out and out violation of the spinal cord itself. So with a penetrating injury, um, we're typically thinking about bullets or knives, certainly here in the States on the domestic side of things, but obviously in a war zone, as you said, if there's an IED or any other kind of explosion, any sort of shrapnel can penetrate the body and damage the spinal cord. Um, one big difference I will point out between, say, a knife, a, a stab wound where the blade makes it through the spinal cord, or even shrapnel from an explosion versus a bullet. Bullets, interestingly, we've seen when they penetrate the body, in particular, we see this with injuries to the head and brain, but also with the spinal cord, which is similar neurologic tissue. Um, the bullets have what we call a cavitation effect around them, that when they pass through the nervous tissue, which is kind of, it's like a jelly. It's a gelatinous substance, just physically nervous tissue. Uh, we see this in the brain and spinal cord that the bullet itself passes through the tissue and does the damage it does, but because of the velocity at which it's traveling and the compliance and tissue characteristics of the spinal cord or the brain, there's this cavitary effect that happens around the course of the bullet. And so the total injury because of this force that's transmitted through the cord tissue or the brain tissue is much vaster and broader in scope and area and volume than just the path of the bullet itself. And so for all of these reasons, um, a penetrating spinal cord injury is much less treatable and a much worse injury than the closed blunt spinal cord injury. So now having, I guess, defined the enemy, what do you do? Um, I would say, obviously, my experience is in the hospital setting. So by the time I meet these patients, they've already been stabilized in the field. And there's a huge selection bias when you talk to a neurosurgeon or someone who works in the hospital because we only see the patients that survive and make it to us, right? The vast majority of people who uh, experience penetrating spinal cord injuries likely die in the field. And so I never meet them. So my comments on how to manage these people outcome statistics, et cetera, et cetera, they've all passed through the first filter of surviving from the field to the trauma bay and then from the trauma bay to when I get consulted. Um, and so from that perspective and with that caveat, I would say anything that happens in the field should be the same as for any other patient, the ABCs, because the most important thing before a patient makes it from the field to the hospital phase of care is to make sure they survive to the hospital phase of care. And most of what we do for spinal cord injury patients, be they penetrating or blunt injuries, um, are much, they're, they're not in that early acute phase when the injury has happened. The, the places that we really make a difference 
are in terms of long-term survival, long-term functional status and neurologic re recovery, and preventing something called secondary injury that we'll get into uh, shortly, I presume. Um, but for the people in the field, if you have someone with penetrating injuries, single or multiple, stabilize, treat that patient like you would any other and make sure they survive long enough to get to the hospital where we can actually diagnose what's going on inside of them with advanced imaging studies and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I mean, obviously I'm not talking about, uh, patients who've, you know, taken like a shot to the, the T there. Those are like almost instantly fatal. Um, but some kind of penetration in maybe the, the thoracic or lumbar spine, um, Obviously, if the patient's not breathing, we need to take his airway, breathe for them. If they become hypotensive, obviously we know how to we know how to handle those things. But how fast does this hypotension take place? Because I've seen a lot of trauma patients and generally shock looks like shock. And what I've been told is when you're dealing with a uh, spinal cord injury, you're gonna get the classic, you know, they're pale above the injury, they're pink below the injury and thus far like that seems like a pretty extreme and easy to find thing i just don't know how fast i should be expecting to see this right um and honestly again not being a field guy myself i don't know how often you actually see or or even can appreciate differences in, in skin tone like that. When you're in the field, there's blood, it's probably dark. I, I don't, so that, you know, thinking a priori, that, that might not be the first thing on my list for what to look for. But if you have someone who has sustained and survived gunshots to the trunk or the neck, and so you have a good suspicion for spinal cord injury, especially if they're awake and they can't move their legs, but they're moving their arms, you know, that's kind of a giveaway. Um, in addition to the ABCs, and once you've cleared that primary level of, of care and intervention, there's obviously spinal precautions that should be taken. Typically, gunshot wounds and penetrating spine injuries, we don't consider unstable mechanically in terms of the spine dislocating, but um, you don't know until you know, right? And you don't know until you have a CT scan or an MRI and you see what structures of the spine are actually damaged. And so even if it's a penetrating injury, you should treat people with spinal precautions in case there's some sort of free fragment of bone, uh, the bullet could be moving around, uh, any dislocated joints of the spine, you don't want to move them and bend them in some way that things slip and further damage the spinal cord. Um, speaking more directly to the neurogenic shock, um, again, I, I won't pretend that I know about these changes to skin color, but as you said, someone in shock looks like they're in shock. And so if you have a strong suspicion for a spinal cord injury um, and the patient appears to be in shock, that might make you think that it's neurogenic in cause. Although with gunshots and penetrating wounds like that, they're probably losing blood as well. And so if, if a bullet has made its way to the spinal cord, it certainly could have found the aorta as well. And so um, as, as you said, someone in shock is in shock and you have to treat them. I, I think the easiest way to distinguish between neurogenic shock and hypovolemic shock is going to be the heart rate, because in the case of neurogenic shock, the heart rate will be low because kind of all of those sympathetic things like the heart rate, the blood pressure, they've all lost their drive. Whereas in a hypovolemic uh, shock picture, like from excessive blood loss, as the blood pressure drops, the heart rate is going to increase to try to compensate and keep perfusing the tissues. So if you see someone that has lost a lot of blood, they clinically appear to be in shock, and yet their heart rate is low and you're scratching your head and wondering, well, that's weird. Why? They might have some impairment to the sympathetic chain in their spinal cord, which is keeping their heart rate from driving up. Okay. And that makes 100% sense. You know, when, you know, three or four vital signs are pointing in one direction, but then you look at exists example the heart rates go in the opposite direction that should give you a pause um you know one confirm that you're correct and then two understand like okay this is something this is something different i may have a different approach now with neurogenic shock i know vasopressors come into it um but am i right to say that first you need to volumize the patient well i would if it seems like they've lost volume, yeah, and I, I don't think that's going to hurt because 
um, again, if this is a penetrating injury, they will have lost blood and you don't know if they're bleeding internally. And just because someone is in neurogenic shock doesn't mean they also have a low volume. You know, they, they also don't have a component of hypovolemic shock as well. Um, so that's never a bad place to start. Um, replete blood, fluids, whatever seems indicated based on that picture. But then if once you've given them product and you know that at least right now their intravascular volume should be enough to perfuse their tissues, but they still are in that shock picture and the heart rate's still low. Um, and again, if the overall picture suggests some kind of spinal cord injury or in an unconscious patient where all you have to go on are these vital signs and the heart rate still isn't coming up, then you might think to yourself, there's a problem with the sympathetic drive time to press. Okay. Um, now, as far as vasopressors, we're pretty limited. Uh, we carry epinephrine. I'm sure there's other sites that'll have norepinephrine and, and uh, maybe even others. Is there one better than the other? Um, from what we know now, norepi seems to be a, an ideal presser of choice for a few reasons. One, it can be given pretty easily. Um, it, it's, it's kind of ubiquitous in its use. So most people are familiar with it, which, you know, at face value, that's not the best reason to use something. But in the real world, in practicality, something that's easy to use and common. So everybody knows how to use it. People know how to hang it, dose it, et cetera. That's, that's a point in its favor for practicality. Um, in terms of actually treating the spinal cord and in the picture of neurogenic shock, norepi covers more of the uh, sympathetic receptor types uh, compared to just epinephrine. And so you're going to get more effect on the heart as well as the peripheral vasculature. That's going to be beneficial. And then uh, kind of stepping even further into my nerdy domain and my academic interest, there's this new concept that we've been exploring called spinal cord perfusion pressure, which is less relevant for penetrating injuries, but we'll talk about it more later on when we discuss the closed blunt injuries. But um, it, it seems that norepi uh, better favors actual perfusion to the spinal cord itself, not just uh, raising the blood pressure or the mean arterial pressure that we can measure. Because there's, there's obviously, there's the mean arterial pressure, the MAP, and the systolic blood pressure, the, these things that we can measure systemically. And then there's the actual pressure of blood perfusing the spinal cord tissue. And there's a little bit more that goes into it than just what the mean arterial pressure is, which we'll talk about later. But when you, at least from what we know now with a few early studies, it seems like norepi is superior for actually perfusing the spinal cord tissue, not just getting up the blood pressure number. Yeah. No, absolutely makes sense. So, you know, once we've done our initial assessments, we've done our initial treatments and stabilization of the patient. Um, we've stabilized the spine to the best of our ability. We're not we're not carrying long boards and uh, moving the patient through the field that way. To be honest, the best he's going to get is probably a litter, um, a fabric litter, and ideally some kind of padding to try and keep them in line. That's probably the best I think he's probably going to get. Um, you know, what other things can I do? What other things can I measure, try to accomplish other than just speed, getting him to somebody who actually knows what they're doing? Um, what else can I do to kind of optimize uh, your success in a hospital? That's going to be the biggest, the biggest stuff right there is getting them to the hospital and getting them to whatever the, the next and closest center. Um, that will be the biggest thing, as well as, of course, the ABCs and, and keeping them uh, alive and treating the shock. Um, but the sooner you get them to a center, the sooner you can put them in the through the process of a formal diagnosis, figuring out what is actually injured, where it is, is there a major vascular injury? Is there injury to the gut or any of the abdominal structures and organs? Is there a spinal cord injury? And if so, where and how severe? Um, all of these things, the sooner they're identified, the sooner the patient can get down the proper uh, workflow towards treating and fixing these things, um, you know, patching the hole in the boat instead of just continuing to bail out water. Um, the other thing I would say in, 
in that field setting before you have a formal diagnosis. People get very excited about MAP goals for spinal cord injury. Um, again, this is within our, in the hospital side, within neurosurgery, we have formal guideline recommendations for keeping an elevated mean arterial pressure for about a week after someone has a spinal cord injury. That's for a closed blunt injury. Uh, that guideline and recommendation does not apply to penetrating injuries. The goal of that is to make sure that kind of as we were just discussing, blood is adequately perfusing the injured spinal cord and preventing what we call secondary injury. So within the spinal cord injury Christmas tree, we have penetrating and blunt like we talked about. But then in general, there's also these two buckets of primary and secondary injury. Primary spinal cord injury is the injury that you have. If it's a bullet, it's where the bullet went through the cord. If it's a dislocated fracture, it's where the bone hit the cord. That's the injury. Mm -hmm. But surrounding that site of injury, there's spinal cord tissue that may be viable but is at risk of being damaged perhaps permanently in the early days following that injury, either through low blood flow, hypoperfusion, inflammatory reactions, ongoing compression if you don't treat it surgically soon enough, and it's something that could be compressed. And so that's what we call the secondary injury. And so these blood pressure goals are really more geared toward preventing the secondary injury, which kind of evolves over the first few days. So until the patient is in the hospital, has had advanced imaging and actually been diagnosed and stabilized with their spinal cord injury, I don't think there's much of a role for elevating the mean arterial pressures, especially in an austere setting in the field, getting evac where resources are limited and time is of the essence. So what I would say is if you just do good ABCs, get the patient into the hospital as soon as possible. And if everything else is accounted for and you have the time and uh, the resources to just think about the spinal cord, don't go crazy chasing some high number. Just avoid drops in the blood pressure. If you can avoid hypotension and hypoperfusion and keep the MAP and the systolic at least normal, that's going to be great until you get them to an advanced center where they can be formally diagnosed and go down the appropriate pathway. Nice. Well, I definitely I want to jump into this blunt trauma because I want to nerd out about secondary injury. Um, so let's just jump into that. Um, so, you know, I think this is way more common for us than, uh, some kind of penetration is, you know, if you have a fall from height, you have some kind of vehicle accident, et cetera, but you get a very conscious, very much in pain patient. And, um, you know, maybe there's some kind of a neurological deficit, hopefully, uh, that you can find. And it's not just my back hurts. Um, you know, if we can, would you mind just walking through an, an assessment of somebody who has a, a blunt trauma to the spine? Yeah. And uh, that's actually a really good point you make that there's some patients have injuries to their spine and they just have back pain. And some patients have injuries to their spine and they have neurologic deficit. There's a, a vast amount of spinal trauma that occurs with no damage to any of the spinal cord or tissue or nerves itself. You can have just bony spinal trauma. And that's a whole different animal uh, than when someone has an injury to the spinal cord itself. So th the way we think about blunt spinal trauma, um, there's a score that was developed called TLIX, which is the thoracolumbar injury classification scale, I think, or, or score. I don't remember the S. And this isn't uh, something that was generated by a randomized controlled trial or uh, some meta-analysis of literature. It's a, it's a score that was developed by a panel of experts. So take that for what you will. But it was a, a, a group of senior level expert, world-renowned spine surgeons who came together, reviewed literature, and agreed on this is what we think is important. And this is and you know this is something for experts in hospitals who are making decisions. Uh, but it, it's a score that helps you a judge if a patient's spinal fracture is something that requires surgery or not. And the kinds of things that go into the score are a good way uh, to kind of list out the kinds of things we think about. And it's essentially at, at a very simple level. Is the fracture something that's mechanically stable or mechanically unstable? And what that means for the spine is, uh, can the spine maintain the patient's body in upright posture without pain uh, 
and without gradually losing its alignment over time. That's what, that's a simple way to think about spinal stability. Can the spine hold itself up and keep the body and the trunk up? And then does the patient have any neurologic dysfunction? So that would be the presence of a spinal cord injury or a, a nerve injury, a nerve that's exiting the spine, but not the spinal cord itself. And that's really the, the big picture of how we think about spinal trauma. Is the fracture bad enough that it's going to inhibit the spine's ability to hold itself together and keep the body up? And is there some involvement of the spinal cord or the exiting roots? And the worse the fracture is and the worse the involvement of the nervous tissue is, the more likely we are to need to do a surgery to either fix and stabilize the spine and to take pressure off the spinal cord tissue or the nerves tissue. Okay. So, I mean, essentially just sit the patient up. Is their spine stable? Because I got to be honest, that's something that we are told absolutely do not ever move the guy's spine because he'll break in half. Right. And you shouldn't do that until they've made it to the hospital and get a CT scan. Okay. And that's why we, we maintain those spinal precautions. Then once they get to the hospital, then they get a CT scan. Then there, there are certain kinds of uh, fractures of the spine, certainly in the thoracic and lumbar spine, that the same fracture pattern that you see on a CT scan, depending on the patient's clinical symptoms related to it, can be treated with nothing, with a brace, with uh, percutaneously putting in a needle and squirting some cement into that bone, or putting in screws and rods across the fracture and fusing it in place. And some of those fractures, which typically just involve the, the body of the vertebra, so if you picture a spine in your mind, there's the square part, and then there's the stuff that sticks out in the back that make the bumps along your back. That square part in the front is the body of the vertebra. And there's a number of fractures to the body of the vertebra that we get a CAT scan. We know that's the only fracture. The patient doesn't have any neurologic issues. It's just a fracture to the bone. They say my back hurts. We'll sit them upright and ask, does, does the pain get worse when you're upright and your spine is bearing weight? And then does it feel better when you lie flat again and take the weight off? And if they say yes, then that indicates to us clinically that fracture is less stable or more unstable. It's, a, it's not black and white, yeah. but that tells us that if this person is having pain when this, there's weight on this fracture, maybe it needs a little support and stabilization in, in the form of a brace or a cement injection or even a, a surgical fusion. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Um, and as far as neuro... Essentially, you're just doing, you know, motor sensory down dermatones, ask them to move their leg, move their foot, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, in the setting of trauma, I think that uh, the motor exam is by far the most important. You know, people who have been in a car accident or had a bad fall, especially if they have other injuries, um, the sensation getting a specific dermatome, especially somewhere in the thoracic spine, can be very difficult. You get a ballpark. And now, obviously, we're, we're very privileged to have CT scans and even MRIs uh, sometimes, even in the acute setting of trauma. And so, you know, we, we kind of take off our professor hats where we try to examine the patient and localize where the lesion is. And instead, we can just get a picture and we know where it is, which is good. But you still have to be able to think and appreciate what's happening in reality with the patient and their body and their experiences, not just what you see on a scan on a computer screen. Um, but yes, so in the, in the setting of a spinal trauma, when there's an injury, that evaluation is different. Uh, when there's a, a spinal cord injury, I should say that evaluation is different. Uh, you're evaluating their motor function, both the ability to move different muscle groups within the limb, as well as how strong they can, uh, within each group. Uh, so there's a grading to it as well as the presence or absence of function. There is sensation. Um, and then we also check uh, sensation around the anus and rectal tone um, uh, and something, this is a fun bit of trivia, something called the bulbo cavernosus <laughs> reflex. And this is actually a, to, yeah, your lap. This, and this is a way, if you really want to get in the weeds, that you can distinguish actual spinal cord injury versus spinal shock. Um, because in the setting of spinal shock, so let's say you have a, let's say you have someone with a fracture uh, or some blunt uh, contusive injury down in the low thoracic spine around T9 or T10. Okay, so bottom of the trunk where you're starting to get towards the lower back. Uh, 
patient comes in, they're not moving their legs, uh, they can't feel their legs or feet, and then they don't have rectal tone. And so you think to yourself, does this person have a spinal cord injury out and out, or is this spinal shock? How can you distinguish it? Well, the bulbocavernosus reflex, this is a reflex arc that goes from the glands of the penis or the clitoris in female patients um, back to the, the sacral roots in the spinal cord and then back out again. So it's a closed reflex arc that doesn't go up the spinal cord to the brain and come back down. It's a closed reflex arc down there. Just like uh, when you tap someone's knee, that's a closed reflex arc. It doesn't go up to the brain. If you're walking along barefoot and you step on something sharp, your foot will lift up. That doesn't go to the brain. That's all down between the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, and the muscles involved uh, because it, it saves time and it withdraws you from a painful stimulus quicker than if it had to go all the way up to your brain. And so this reflex, uh, the easiest way to do it is if you have a uh, Foley in place, a Foley catheter, which almost everyone does. And so if you're assessing rectal tone on a patient, they have a Foley in place, your finger is in the rectum, there's no rectal tone. If you tug on the Foley catheter, the rectum will squeeze around you. It will induce rectal tone. And that's a positive bulbocavernosus reflex. So in the setting of spinal shock, all neurologic function of that shocked spinal cord tissue is, is gone. It's all in dysfunction. So you will not have a bulbocavernosus reflex in the setting of spinal shock. Whereas in a true spinal cord injury, if, the, if you have a true spinal cord injury at T9 or T10, what you're losing is the communication between the brain and those root nerves down below the level of injury. But the tissue below the level of injury is not itself damaged. So you will have a positive bulbocavernosus reflex. So in the setting of, of uh, someone who has spinal trauma um, around, again, like thoracic spine, if you have the presence of a bulbocavernosus reflex and they're not moving their legs, that indicates it's a true spinal cord injury, which is sad. That's a bag a bad prognostic sign, we would say, for that patient. Whereas if you have someone who can't move their legs and they also don't have a bulbocavernosus reflex, then you might think to yourself, well, I know the injury is nowhere near those sacral roots affecting this reflex. So then I might think, well, the entire spinal cord is in this state of dysfunction and shock. Maybe this is just spinal shock. This patient has a better chance of recovery. Doesn't change what you do immediately, um, because you're going to treat them as if they have a bad injury anyway. You're going to treat them as if it's the worst thing possible so you don't lose the chance to help them. But you can counsel the patient, you can counsel their family, um, and you can know better what to expect. Uh, in that case, you would imagine they have spinal shock, not an out and out spinal cord injury. Okay. No, that makes sense. And I also think I should apologize to all my Navy brethren that I thought they were making this up this whole time. So, um, Oh no, <laughs> they always bring it up every exam. No, this is, this is something. Yeah. <laughs> this is something we, uh, we, we pimp our interns on every year in neurosurgery. Uh, this yep. is something we all learn. Yeah. Um, so going into actually treating the injury, the secondary injury, right? So obviously direct injury, is the there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Time will heal this if it's going to heal at all. The secondary injury, you know, that could be, you know, the inflammatory response, uh, you know, essentially whatever pressure remains on the injury. And essentially, if I'm gathering this right, you're just, you've decreased the perfusion to that area so the body can't heal it because um, the blood flow can't get to it, right? Um, so kind of walk me through, like, you know, steroids, I'm sure, always come up, uh, you know, stop the inflammatory process, and that'll fix everything. But, um, you know, essentially every study I've ever, whether it be sepsis or TBI or spinal cord injury, at first they say, yes, give steroids. And then like the next year, they're like, nah, never mind, don't do it. Um, is that true? Okay, perfect. <laughs> that's a great summary. That's a that's a great summary of uh, the literature on steroids and spinal cord injury. So why don't we, um, let's talk about the things that almost no one would argue about, and then we'll work our way out into the weeds. Okay. So the, the things that neurosurgeons do for spinal cord injury. So I, again, 
This is, you've made it to the hospital, you've survived the primary injury. If it's a polytrauma, you've survived all that. Yep. Um, now you're at the phase where you're here, you're diagnosed and neurosurgery is getting involved. So I think in my mind, the two biggest things are compression and perfusion. So compression, um, this would be, you have a spinal cord injury and classically it would be a fracture dislocation. I know I keep doing this gesture. So the spine is this column of bones and in the back part, they make a bony tunnel that the spinal cord travels through. So you can imagine if we have two vertebra and they slip, that tunnel is going to be compromised and the spinal cord will be pinched. Also, there can be fractures where pieces of bones get pushed into the spinal canal and that's pushing on the spinal cord. So that affects the spinal cord in two major ways. One, by direct mechanical derangement of the tissue itself. You know, you push on something, the tissue gets damaged. Neurons and, and nerves are kind of long strings and wires. They can get torn. It can be literally damaged. Also, when something is under pressure, any tissue in the body, it's getting less blood flow because the pressure inside that tissue is higher. And so blood has a harder time getting in. I can prove this to you. If you take your finger and push down on your hand or your skin anywhere, it will get white. And then when you lift up, that white spot gradually gets pink and gets back to its normal color. You prevented blood from coming in, then it could come back in. Same thing happens to the spinal cord. So when you have a patient with a spinal cord injury and there is continuous ongoing mechanical compression, the sooner you decompress that, the better it is for the spinal cord. Now, how soon is soon enough? The number that most people have generally accepted these days is within 24 hours, that if you can decompress the spinal cord within 24 hours of the injury, those people have better outcomes than people who get decompressed after 24 hours. That's based on one large, fairly well done, but flawed like any trial is trial. Um, that was solely focused on surgical timing and acute spinal cord injury. Uh, that was the name of the trial. And so they found that people who got decompressed within 24 hours of injury did better. Now, does that mean that someone who gets decompressed at 10 hours and someone who gets decompressed at 20 hours are the same? Does that mean that if someone comes in immediately, you can just wait until 24 hours? People argue about that. There are some people who are more aggressive and who view this as a continuous variable, not a categorical variable where you just go from one bucket to the other. And I would argue that that makes sense physically and physiologically. The sooner you take the pressure off, the better it is for the tissue. On the other hand, um, it might be that even if you decompress them 10 hours earlier, whatever damage was done and whatever benefit you give them is... Even if there is a real benefit, it's so small that it's not clinically manifest. So you save 2% more neurons, but what does that actually mean functionally for the patient? Does, is that the difference between them walking again or not? Probably not. And so even if you save more spinal cord tissue, maybe that doesn't manifest as something meaningful in terms of functionality and neurologic recovery for the patient in the big picture in their lives. That would be the other side of that argument. The other thing you always have to consider is that this is a surgery. It's a big surgery. It's a, it's a real deal surgery. And depending on where you work, what your hospital is like and what time this injury happens and gets to you, there are many hospitals where if it's a bad enough fracture, that's a very complex surgery you have to do to correct the fracture. There's deformity involved. You have to realign the spine, put in a bunch of screws and do all this as quick as possible in a critically ill, unstable polytrauma patient. That might not be safe to do at one in the morning. It might not even be safe to do within 24 hours of them arriving. And so you always have to remember that you're not treating a spinal cord, you're treating a person. And there's an overall picture to them. A 24 year old football player is not a 70 year old at, you know, with five chronic comorbidities who tripped and fell. And so these patients might take more time to get them ready to undergo the major surgery. And so while I'm a big advocate for early decompression and decompressing people as, as quickly as possible, the phrase I always say on top of that is as soon as safe and feasible. Yep. So 
if I have a patient with a major spinal cord injury, I want them decompressed ASAP as soon as it's safe and feasible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that, I mean, I think that kind of goes with many, many surgeries is people look at a patient as, you know, the next surgical patient, they might not be stable enough to undergo this, you know, controlled trauma of surgery. So like it does, you no good to, you know, complete the perfect surgery and the patient dies because of anesthesia or the patient dies because of fill in the blank. Um, you know, you got your, you got your number, but the patient still died. So then the, the other major thing to, that, that I mentioned was perfusion to the spinal cord. And that I think, um, even, even when there's not direct mechanical compression after a spinal cord injury, the benefit of decompressing the spinal cord after an injury is mostly based around perfusion, blood perfusion to that injured cord. So the two things we really do surgically, if you have a spinal cord injury with a fracture, we put in our screws and rods and we restabilize the bones of the spine. But then we also remove part of the bone from the back of the spine. It gives the spinal cord more room to breathe, so to speak. Yeah. And it decreases the pressure within the spinal cord tissue so blood can get in more easily. Um, that's a surgical way that we increase spinal cord perfusion. Then the other medical way that uh, we mentioned briefly earlier is by elevating the mean arterial pressure, the MAP. So it's within our formal guidelines for spinal cord injury patients to keep the MAP above 85, that's just the magic number, for five to seven days after a spinal cord injury. Um, that number of 85 was uh, kind of picked arbitrarily and then became a habit. And so then because someone picked that number, then people used that number, then that became the normal number. And so then eventually that was the number that was investigated. And so now it's the number in our guidelines. Um, that doesn't mean it, it is the right number. It's just the number that was used. And now it's the number that we do use. But as I alluded to earlier, um, the number, the mean arterial pressure or the systolic blood pressure that you measure systemically doesn't necessarily reflect the perfusion pressure to the spinal cord itself. And so I think many of your listeners will be familiar with the concept of intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure. And we measure that either with a pressure monitor or with an external ventricular drain, an EVD. Everyone who's worked in the setting of trauma has seen these things, right? And so the cerebral perfusion pressure is defined as the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. MAP minus ICP is CPP. You can do the same thing for the spinal cord. And so this is what uh, has been investigated in the past couple of decades. It's kind of gaining traction and getting more interest among researchers in this field is the concept of the spinal cord perfusion pressure, which is the difference between the MAP, the mean arterial pressure, and what we call the intrathecal pressure, which is essentially just the pressure within inside the dura, the sac that contains the spinal cord and the cerebrospinal fluid that it floats in. So it's not exactly the same as the intracranial pressure because we measure that inside the brain itself. Whereas for the spine, we don't put our monitors inside the spinal cord. We just put it inside the dura of the spinal compartment. And so what we've now seen um, based on two prospective observational trials, one that was done in Canada and one that was done in England, that this number, the spinal cord perfusion pressure, is a superior predictor of neurologic recovery after a spinal cord injury when compared to the mean arterial pressure, our traditional goal parameter, or the intrathecal pressure alone itself. This number outperformed both of those in terms of predicting neurologic recovery in two prospective uh, studies. Um, importantly, and most interestingly, they also identified a number for that spinal cord perfusion pressure that was predictive of neurological reco recovery. So particularly based on the study from Canada that was done by an orthopedic spine surgeon named Brian Kwan, who's kind of at the tip of the spear for this stuff. Um, he found that patients whose spinal cord perfusion pressure dropped beneath 50 millimeters of mercury were significantly less likely to improve in their neurologic function at six months after their spinal cord injury. Um, now, for a host of reasons that that trial, the, the number of significance was 50, there was an inflection point 
um, at 65 in their numbers. And just to give a cushion, the number that is tended to be adopted at different hospitals in the United States and North America, including at Rush University and Cook County Hospital, where I work, and we've rolled out a, a protocol targeting this instead of mean arterial pressure. Most of us are using a number 65. So to keep the spinal cord perfusion pressure greater than 65 um, to help prevent secondary injury and make sure that there's adequate blood flow getting actually reaching the spinal cord, not just the overall blood pressure is high enough, but that that pressure is perfusing the spinal cord successfully. Okay. What, what is a normal interthecal pressure? That's a great question. Um, the number we use is around 15 as an upper limit, 10 to 15. And that vary, that varies. Um, that changes over time. It changes in the course of the day. It changes with your position of your body. So you can imagine the central nervous system floats in cerebrospinal fluid. It's all contained within this membrane that we call the dura. It's Latin, the dura mater. It means tough mother because there's these three layers that surround the nervous tissue, and this is the outermost and strongest of them. So you can imagine that the brain and the spinal cord are all continuous floating in this water, the cerebrospinal fluid. And so if you imagine this big water balloon, when I'm sitting upright or standing upright, all the water, the weight of the water is at the bottom. So right now in this posture, my intracranial pressure is relatively lower and the pressure in my spinal compartment at the bottom is relatively higher. If I were to lay flat, the pressure inside my head is going to be higher and the pressure at the bottom of my spinal cord is going to be relatively lower. And so it varies throughout the day because of our posture. It also varies, uh, obviously, with our sympathetic activation. Um, so it can go up when we're in a state of pain. It can go down when the pain goes away. And then finally, it varies with our respiration, depending on what segment of the spine you're in. So this doesn't really affect uh, the neck as much, but... Uh, certainly the thoracic and the lumbar compartments, they're within the thoracic cavity. And so the way the human body breathes, it's, it's what we call negative pressure ventilation. It's when, when we have people intubated and we're giving them air, that's positive pressure. We're blowing air in. The way the human body naturally breathes, actually, the diaphragm, which is a long, flat muscle along the base of the thorax that separates the chest from the abdomen, it contracts and it pulls down which increases the internal volume of the thorax, the chest. And because nature abhors a vacuum, when you increase the volume within the chest, that causes the lungs to inflate and expand into it. And that draws air in by a vacuum effect through the mouth trachea and down into the lungs. And then when you exhale, the diaphragm relaxes, that pressure is released, the lungs collapse and we breathe out. What does that mean? That means that as the thorax is increasing, and the pressure within the, the thoracic compartment of the chest decreases because the volume is increasing, that actually sucks CSF down relatively from the cranial compartment. And so the pressure, the intrathecal pressure within the spinal compartment of the dura uh, in the spinal compartment, when a patient breathes in, that same vacuum effect that brings in air draws CSF from the head into the spine. And when you breathe out, it pushes it back up from the spine to the head. And there's this continuous back and forth gradient uh, in the course of our respiration. So it, it varies with a, a wide number of things. But what we set as a general roof is anywhere from 10 to 15 is what we call normal for the intrathecal pressure. And so you can do easy you know, back of the napkin calculation that if you want your spinal cord perfusion pressure to be at least 50, uh, 65, and we're calling a normal intrathecal pressure 10 to 15, what do your maps need to be to maintain that perfusion pressure as long as the intrathecal pressure isn't too high? Certainly not 85, right? And so the, 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 big, the big exciting things that those of us investigating spinal cord perfusion pressure are looking at are one is if we target this number instead of the mean arterial pressure, and we know that we're still optimizing the spinal cord perfusion and spinal cord uh, neurologic recovery, does that mean we can avoid pressing these, patient, these patients to such high levels of MAPS, avoid giving them the pressors, avoid the side effects and associated negative effects that can happen with pressors? And in particular, in older people who may have a bad heart, which is an increasing population we're seeing in spinal cord injury, they get something called central cord syndrome, a certain kind of injury to the cervical spine, 
perhaps these people who have bad hearts and who don't have as robust of a cardiovascular system, we can avoid hitting them for a week with all of these pressors driving their blood pressure up if we know that the cord is perfusing itself just fine. Now, what's the other variable in that equation? The intrathecal pressure. Let's say we have a patient who has a spinal cord injury. The spinal cord took a big hit. We decompressed it. But just like if you get hit in the knee or hit in the elbow, what happens to the body's tissue when it has a, a blunt concussive force? It swells, right? The spinal cord injury swells and has edema just like anything else in the body. So perhaps you have a patient who has an isolated spinal cord injury. They haven't lost a lot of blood. They have a good heart. The issue is not their mean arterial pressure. They're perfusing their body fine. But as the spinal cord swells, the intrathecal pressure gets so high that the barrier to entry for that blood reaching the spinal cord is too great. And so you could drive their maps through the roof and just overcome that barrier to perfusion, or you can try to lower the intrathecal pressure. How can you do that? Surgical decompression, which we talked about, which we always do. There are some centers where while they're doing their surgical decompression, they actually ultrasound the spinal cord. And if they don't see good open CSF flow, water surrounding the spinal cord on all sides, they open the dura and sew in a patch to make it bigger. So there's more room for that spinal cord to swell, lowering the intrathecal pressure by increasing the volume of the intrathecal space. Or... You can treat it just like we treat ICP in the head. You can put in a lumbar drain and drain off CSF to lower the intrathecal pressure, which gets your perfusion pressure at goal without doing anything to the mean arterial pressure. That is, in fact, the method that we favor where I work. Uh, that's what uh, Brian Kwan in Canada uses. That's what they use at UCSF and a few other centers in the United States. We uh, here in North America have tended to favor lumbar drains because you have the option of opening them and draining fluid. The other way that you can measure spinal cord perfusion pressure is just with a direct pressure probe, kind of like a bolt, if you've seen those in, in cranial trauma patients. It's just a wire that just measures the pressure inside the system. It doesn't have a drain. Whereas if you put in a lumbar drain, you can transduce intrathecal pressure off that, just like we measure intracranial pressure from an EVD, with the added bonus that you can open it up and drain fluid if you want to try to lower the intrathecal pressure. No, oh, no, oh, very good, very good. Um, now, part of one of the questions I wanted to ask is, you know, when we were talking about using vasopressors and providing perfusion, um, like those vasopressors, like the way they do their job, they constrict blood vessels. And from what I understand, they constrict blood vessels throughout the body. So even though you're getting your numbers higher, you're actually reducing perfusion to the tissue that you're trying to um, perfuse. Does that, I don't know if I'm making any sense. So, I mean, what you're, what, what you're talking about as far as decompressing and just removing the pressure from around the injury allows you to essentially like that injury by vasodilating kind of treated the problem as far as perfusion you've opened up the vessels as long as you can keep the volume going so that it, the patient remains safe essentially i think just removing the pressure from around it would be the better choice i would of course i'm not a doctor <laughs> don't take my advice no, uh pers i i agree with you completely and you know th th things uh Things that appear complex at face value oftentimes are uh, simpler than you might think the more you look into them. And it's exactly as you described. It's a very simple problem. You're trying to get the blood to perfuse the tissue, the target tissue, right? And so if you drive the map through the roof uh, using, for example, phenylephrine, the way that increases blood pressure is by constricting the blood vessels. And so the internal pressure within that tube goes higher because you decrease the radius. Well, great you are making the number on that monitor a better number, but what are you actually doing to the tissue of interest? What are you actually doing biologically? And so I alluded earlier that there was uh, some difference in the effect on perfusion pressure with different uh, pressors. And at least from one study where this was looked at, again, this is a new concept, so there's not a vast body of literature, 
but at least from one study that actually compared different vasopressor agents in patients where they were measuring intrathecal pressure to calculate the perfusion, norepinephrine uh, outperformed all other agents because it had the least effect on the intrathecal pressure while successfully elevating the mean arterial pressure. Uh, ironically, dopamine, which decades ago was kind of the standard go-to agent for spinal cord injury, dopamine appeared to raise the intrathecal pressure as well as the mean arterial pressure. So it really had no net effect on the actual spinal cord perfusion pressure. But exactly as you say, um, the way these agents raise the blood pressure frequently, including norepinephrine, uh, a component of norepi's effect is by constricting blood vessels, which is going to uh, inhibit the end effect that, uh, that we're trying to achieve, which is perfusing the spinal cord. Now, it also works by increasing the output from the heart, uh, the the force and frequency of the of of each heartbeat, and so that has some positive effect on perfusion without making a blockage at the end organ. But exactly as you say, and this is why uh, I strongly favor early surgical decompression, effective surgical decompression. You know, really doing a good job. Um, as I said, at the the people at Shock Trauma in Maryland doing the duraplasty to make more room around the cord, and then this lumbar drainage uh, method drawing off CSF to decrease the volume of uh, cerebrospinal fluid and thus decrease the intrathecal pressure. All of these are ways to increase perfusion without manipulating the mean arterial pressure, which is easier on old patients' hearts with bad cardiovascular systems or comorbidities, and as you say. Um, increases the perfusion without doing anything to the blood vessels, actually bringing the blood into the spinal cord tissue itself. Um, and, and on that topic, I will also mention and, and credit um, uh, Dr. Nick Theodore, who's a very senior, well-known neurosurgeon um, who recently published a trial looking at cerebrospinal fluid drainage uh, for this very reason. He didn't, in this trial, he didn't target spinal cord perfusion pressure. He just set a goal for the intrathecal pressure just to keep it less than 15. And so all these patients, he, it was a very small trial, but he randomized patients to everyone got a lumbar drain and some people just got MAP goals. Other people got their, uh, they had CSF drainage through the lumbar drain to keep the intrathecal pressure less than 15. And that group of patients had superior neurologic outcomes. Uh, after the acute phase of injury. And he also showed in so doing, uh, even though he wasn't targeting the perfusion pressure, he still calculated it for these patients. And he showed that draining CSF to lower the intrathecal pressure did successfully and effectively increase the calculated perfusion pressure, which was a question in the field was, is this even feasible? Is it safe? Can you even drain enough CSF to affect that number and affect neurologic status? And so although this was an early and small trial, he did show in a prospective randomized trial that draining CSF does affect the intrathecal pressure and doing so does raise the perfusion pressure. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And I mean, in a, you know, a drain is not particularly difficult. Like you don't, you don't need CT guidance or, you know, you don't need a C arm or anything like that to put it in place. I mean, this is epidurals are done everywhere in the world for pregnancies. Um, so it's not a particularly complicated thing. An intern on the neurosurgical service can place a lumbar drain without supervision safely, effectively, without complication in almost every case. Um, another reason that I and my colleagues, we favor the lumbar drain is because it can be placed anytime, anywhere. We place them bedside. So our protocol at Rush and Cook County Hospital here in Chicago is that if a patient is going to be in the operating room within one hour of arriving for a spinal cord injury, we just place the lumbar drain in the operating room. If they're going to be delayed greater than one hour for whatever reason, if it's you know, if they're going to be taken to surgery in the morning, if they have a complex polytrauma, if they're going to be delayed more than an hour, we just place the lumbar drain bedside so we can start the perfusion pressure protocol. Now, we don't drain CSF until after a patient's been surgically decompressed. That hasn't been reported yet in the literature. And so we don't know if the spinal cord is pinched and there's no CSF flow around it and we try to drain fluid. We don't know if that will do damage up there and do more harm than good. Once the patient's been surgically decompressed and there's CSF flow around the cord in the site of injury, there's communication, then we start draining. 
But at the very least, even before surgery, we can put the drain in, start measuring the intrathecal pressure to calculate the perfusion pressure and target that with that protocol um, rather than just doing blind map goals. I used to say conventional map goals. Now I just say blind map goals because that's what it is. You're not measuring anything or targeting anything in the spinal compartment. You're looking at a systemic number. Um, another benefit I found to the lumbar drains, in addition to uh, their timing of placement, you can do them before surgery. In one case, we did them after surgery with fluoroscopic guidance because it was just a technically challenging one and anyone can do it. The direct pressure probes have to be placed during surgery and they're placed at the site of injury. When you've decompressed the spinal cord, you're looking at the dura, you thread this little pressure probe into the dura at the site of injury. And there have been some complications reported with these devices because it's at the site of injury where your incision is, where you make a surgical cavity. Uh, some centers have reported CSF leaks and a little fluid pocket that forms around that thing because it's coming out where your actual surgery was. The lumbar drain is far away from your actual surgery. And it's just inserted percutaneously just with a needle poke. So there's a much lower risk of a CSF leak developing afterwards because you haven't made a big cavity with your surgery that fluid can leak into. And so there, there haven't been any complications reported with lumbar drains in the setting of spinal cord injury, uh, whereas there have been some complications reported with these pressure probes. Um, I will say one caveat that be, because I'm an honest broker, the people who favor these pressure probes favor them because they are more accurate. And when I say more accurate, I mean you're measuring the pressure at the site of the injury. You're actually getting the pressure where the injury is. And you you would say, well, that's the most important pressure, right? I want to know where the pressure is at the site of the spinal cord injury because that's the pressure I want to target for my perfusion. The pressure you transduce from a lumbar drain that the tip of that catheter is usually down in the lower thoracic or lumbar spine. And so the pressure you measure from that is almost certainly not the same pressure that is at the site of an injury up here in the neck if it's a cervical spinal cord injury. And so you might say to yourself, well, gadzooks, here I am targeting this number. It's nowhere near anatomically the injury. And in fact, a group in England put both in on patients in a trial and compared them and they proved if you have a cervical spinal cord injury and you put a pressure probe there, and then you also put in a lumbar drain and transduce intrathecal pressure off that, it's not measuring the same number. They proved it. I admit it. So why do we still favor using the numbers from the lumbar drain? Because in the prospective trial from Brian Kwan's group in Canada that identified that target number that we used, the 65, they were using lumbar drains. So whether or not the number that they transduced in that trial was the actual true physical pressure at the site of injury, keeping pressures above that number from a lumbar drain correlated with neurological recovery. So in a sense, you don't need to know the real pressure at the site of injury. You just need to know from the number that you're measuring, what do I keep it above? And then you get all the other added benefits of the timing of placement for the lumbar drain and the capacity to use it to drain fluid and decrease the intrathecal pressure. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I mean, like Voltaire said, and my friend uh, Doug Powell says, the enemy of good is perfect. And you might put your, you put your site, you know, exactly where it needs to be and you screw something else up. You still didn't win. All right. Um, Believe it or not, we say that a lot in surgery. <laughs> uh, is, is there anything else? Uh, we need to talk about when it comes to spinal trauma, whether it be penetrating or blunt. Sure. Um, well, you, you did bring up steroids and I will say right now, the party line formal recommendation uh, in the field of neurosurgery and spine trauma is to not administer steroids for spinal cord injury. That's a formal recommendation from uh, a, a body called the, the joint spine section, the guidelines committee from the two largest, uh, uh, to be fair, it's, it's not the joint spine section. It's the guidelines committee, which is uh, formed of our two largest national level organizations within neurosurgery here in the United States. And that kind of sets, it sets the standard certainly in North America and uh, in, in many areas around the world. Formerly, back 80s into the 90s, steroid administration after acute spinal cord injury was the standard of care. Probably before 
in fact, definitely before early surgical decompression was a standard of care, uh, steroids were. Then it was investigated, and there was some question about the efficacy. The trials investigating it were debated for years. And so the, the previous instantiation of our recommendations said it's at the surgeon's discretion or at the physician's discretion whether to use steroids. Now our formal recommendation is don't use steroids out and out. Why? Because the effect of them on neurologic recovery was deemed to be modest, if real at all. Whereas you're giving these people who just had a major trauma and now often have a surgical incision, very high doses of steroids for a number of days. And so the side effects from giving these uh, medications were killing people uh, from pneumonia, from wound breakdown and infection, GI side effects. And so it was deemed that the juice was not worth the squeeze. Now, does that mean no one uses these anymore? No. Um, my uh, current and future mentor, David Aconquo at the University of Pittsburgh, um, always makes the point that, you know, he, he, uh, he's very involved with the NFL and, and football players and professional athletes. And so he always says if a, a young world-class professional athlete gets a spinal cord injury, well, I'm pretty sure their body can handle high dose steroids. You know, they're, they're a fit, healthy, perfect specimen. They can handle high dose steroids. And, you know, there's been a lot invested in that person's neurologic recovery, motor recovery. So it would make sense to use them there. Whereas an 82 year old who falls down the stairs and has diabetes and emphysema and bad lungs, steroids can kill that person. So he kind of advocates more of a judicious approach to it. Um, but by and large, people have really moved away from steroids for spinal cord injury. Um, I will uh, say that now that patients with spinal cord injuries where I work and at a number of different centers come prepackaged with a lumbar drain, a direction that I'm starting to think about and writing up a, a grant proposal for a trial is administering medications directly intrathecally. Um, so you avoid systemic administration you avoid having to dose things so highly because you're not giving them to the whole body at a high enough dose that they get to the spinal cord and you shouldn't have as much systemic side effects. So something I'm talking with my seniors about and writing a proposal, a proposal about is to administer steroids directly through the lumbar drain into the intrathecal space to see if you can get some benefit by reducing the inflammation in the intrathecal space and avoid those systemic side effects because the drug shouldn't be making it to the lungs, shouldn't be making it to the skin and soft tissues where your surgical incision is. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense as long as it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Right. Or, or the, again, the benefit of giving it directly to the target tissue is that you can give it in a much lower dose. You know, if you, if you're coming from outside the blood brain barrier in, you have to give such a huge dose to get an effective dose at the target tissue. Whereas if you're giving it straight to the spinal cord, you don't have to give so much. And so the, the risk of it crossing over and having a significant uh, high, high dose effect in the other tissues of the body is much lower. And so the question becomes, so what dose do you give uh, directly intrathecally? Does it even make a difference? And, and that's what we're gonna try to find out. But whether or not steroids are the answer, um, a number of other medications that are currently being investigated or even stem cells uh, investigated in the acute phase of injury. Y you can imagine all sorts of things that might be tested and tried now that patients come with a lumbar drain at some hospitals when they have a spinal cord injury. So you already have access. You're not adding some uh, procedure to them for the sake of research, which would be a greater ethical concern. Now they already have a lumbar drain in place. So then you could think to yourself, well, I'm not adding the procedure of placing the drain for any research purposes. It's already there. What might I put in the drain instead of just taking CSF out? Yeah. Awesome. Um, again, anything else we need to talk about? Well, I will make one other tiny plug for a good friend of mine and a whole giant uh, world of uh, research here because everything we've been talking about today is the acute phase of spinal cord injury. Um, that's because, you know, we're talking about the field setting, the austere setting, getting to the hospital alive, and then the things that happen immediately in that acute setting. And that's where most of my professional academic interest lies. I'm interested in this acute phase of injury, 
early decompression, the blood pressure and spinal cord perfusion pressure. That's just the stuff that I happen to work on. But the vast majority of spinal cord injury patients living today didn't just get injured. They got injured a year ago or months ago, and they've entered what we call either the subacute, which is a period of months after it, or then the chronic phase of injury where they're just living with it. Um, and so the things that I look at are getting people to that phase of injury, stabilizing the injury that they have, minimizing it, and trying to increase their odds of recovering. But once they enter the chronic phase of spinal cord injury, they have the injury they have. And so whereas the things I've been talking about with you today are trying to prevent someone from remaining paralyzed or being paralyzed. I, we all have to acknowledge the real silver bullet and the, the holy grail in this uh, realm is taking someone and getting them out of a wheelchair. Right. And that would be a true cure for paralysis where, and, and that's, you know, the, the things I'm working on are trying to prevent paralysis, curing paralysis. I'm not smart enough. There's a number of people who are smart enough to even attempt it, though. And so there's there's a variety of different methods that are being investigated now. Stem cell transplantation, various different kinds of, of uh, stem cells and, and potential cells transplanted to the site of injury in the hopes of having some neuron and nerve growth across that injury cavity. People are investigating scaffolds, which would be a material implant to put into the injury cavity to help encourage and facilitate nerve growth across that injury. Uh, but then you might think to yourself, our biology is not advanced enough. We, we don't know how to heal the spinal cord. Let's get a functional outcome for the patients who are alive today. And so people have looked into things like spinal cord stimulation, which is uh, essentially, you could imagine an electrical bypass. So you could put in some sensors in a region of the brain that communicate with wires to stimulators down below the level of injury and try to communicate some motor command from the brain to the motor output of the legs. Um, there's a number of companies that are working on this, both to get the legs to move, but also just to help people interact with computers. Uh, obviously, Neuralink, Elon Musk's company, has, has a, a patient with an implant now who's controlling a cursor, playing video games with his brain. Uh, that's very relevant for patients that have a cervical injury so they don't have the use of their arms and hands. Um, and then the, the friend of mine I, I wanted to mention, I'll say two actually, Benjamin Rappaport and Ian Cahigas, who are both neurosurgeons. Uh, Ben's in New York. Ian is at the University of Pennsylvania right now and, and Philadelphia. I've known them both for many years. They're both MD, PhD, super genius, Tony Stark kind of guy, neurosurgeons. And uh, what they're working on is a different kind of brain computer or brain machine interface where it, it's... On the brain end, it's a, it's a technical different kind of implant, uh, not like Neuralink's, but with the same goal of having commands from the brain communicate to a computer to move a cursor, and then even eventually trying to get the legs to move. Ian um, did his, surgical, his neurosurgical residency at the University of Miami, where I did medical school, and I, I knew him then, and we worked together on some things, and he did some exciting projects where um, sensors were implanted and actually... Uh, could move bionic legs. Uh, and, and so that's one area of interest where if you can get someone to move a cursor on a computer with their brain, well, then what could you put at the other end of that besides a computer, perhaps some bionic legs so you can get somebody up moving around functionally through their community, again, out of the chair, right? So um, those are some really far frontier tip of the spear things for um, chronic spinal cord injury that again, where, whereas I, in the acute phase injury, I'm interested in preventing as much injury as possible. These are people who are really doing the Lord's work and trying to actually cure paralysis. Um, and I, you know, I, my hat is off to them. I don't have the brain power for it, but, um, for the vast majority of spinal cord injury patients who are alive today, living with long-term and, uh, unfortunately, likely permanent disability from that. These are the investigative and uh, really frontier interventions that, that can make a huge, huge impact, both in their quality of life, their functionality, um, and their, you know, ability to contribute to their communities. And, and you know, what else is there that, that we as humans enjoy, but to have some independence, be able to do the things we want to do and contribute to the community around us Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, JP. I really appreciate it. 
It was great talking with you, Dennis. I, I really appreciate you having me on and, and being able to talk to your audience about these issues, which are obviously so near and dear to my heart. That's it for today's podcast. Make sure to go to our website, www.prolongedfieldcare.org. Check out our free downloads and a ton of other helpful information. Grab a bag of our fresh roasted PFC coffee. Links in the description below. And stay on the bleeding edge of combat and austere medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast, out. Out.